Good morning to everyone in the brick and mortar and in the Zoom room. I um, want to welcome you to the first Sunday of Christmas Tide. Gave us a beautiful, beautiful Christmas Eve, and it's really one of my greater joys to be in the grounding Sunday following Christmas Eve. So, Parker and I wanted to start with some announcements and then uh, get into our prelude on the harp. Yes, if you will look at page six in your bulletin, we have uh, the January calendar and all the, up, all the things upcoming in that month. Um, I would like to note the art show. I think the last day that things are due is January 31st. Uh, so invite friends, people in the community to submit some things and we'll get to be in awe of the beauty that people get to create. And we also want to note that next week, adult Christian formation begins with some new emphases. The weaving science and faith class will begin with an emphasis on mindfulness and prayer and the connections between the two. And then uh, there'll be a return of the covenant class as well as the Sunday morning news class. And then Chris and Parker will be launching with Breck and Sam Parler into a adult formation on the history and importance of music. Yes, so that doesn't start exciting. until the second Sunday in January. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. till the ninth. Okay, um, I'm wearing this morning for you my. Uh, I'll show you this. This is my Desmond Tutu dress. This has black and white on either side, and as we come to the font. Part of what we want to acknowledge this morning is the passing of Desmond Tutu, who has done more than his part to manage justice and equity for our world. Um, there are two members of the congregation that went into the hospital Christmas Eve. Um, Dolores Horn is recovering at home, and our own Jamie Jackson went in having suffered a minor stroke. and. Um, as she was being checked out and as the results were still coming in, she said, look, doc, I have to be at church at seven. Can I get dismissed by seven? So Jamie, we love you. And we're glad you were here at seven and we're grateful you're here this morning. Um, I want to invite Ella Wooten forward. And Ella is going to help pour the water. And Ella, I'm going to invite you to kneel on this piano bench and just to be really safe. And do you want to say anything this morning or do you just want to pour the water? Would you like to say, welcome home children of God? Okay. Welcome home children of God. Perfect. Would you like to pour the water? <laughs> Masks are silly. <laughs> Would you like to pour the water? Let's bring our voices to hers. Welcome home, children of God. Very nicely done, honey. Becky, we're so fortunate to have your talents the Sunday after Christmas as well. Get us in the zone with your prelude.
you've been called to worship by the tenderness of the heart. I invite you to rise up in body or in spirit for the call to worship. Worship is a journey inward and upward that we may discern directions and signs. Life is a journey through, around, and between. The unconscious mind is a reservoir of dreams and visions. There are alternate routes and new directions for our day-to-day -day lives. Faith is a journey through, around, and between. Let us worship God who waits and knocks at the portal of a new year. Let us fling wide the prison doors of our hearts and minds. Amen. Amen. Today, we'll be practicing an age-old tradition of confession where together as a community, we join in one voice. And then we will have a moment of personal prayer. Friends, will you join me now? Creator God, we confess a rut in the road. We confess habitual returns to paths that are weary to guide us toward a rich experience. You are the God of creative energies that arrives to knock upon our awareness and will, embolden us to a first step in a new direction. May we experience safe and steady growth. May we find courage for a novel and demanding circumstances. Hear our confession and our prayer as we long to treasure each step of this human pilgrimage. In and through Christ we pray. Amen.
for mercy to us and bless us with your grace and cause to shine upon us the brightness of your face. Friends, with the joy of a new year upon us, and the many circumstances and new experiences God has in front of us, let us share that joy and the peace of Christ with one another, saying, the peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ, Becky. Peace. Of Christ, everyone. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Peace, Peace of Christ. Christ, everyone. Peace of Christ, sir. Good morning. Peace of Christ. I love that t-shirt. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. <laughs> As we continue greeting one another and getting to every single person in the room because it's possible today, um, peace of Christ, Williams, Jonah, peace of Christ, Dana. Um, we want to sing our children forward uh, for a little bit of time together and really grateful that Ella's got the spirit box. Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ beside me, Christ within me, Christ in the face of those who love me. Oh, Ella, tell me about this spirit box that you have. Um, do you want to make the selection about what I pull out first, or do you want me to do it? So in here, I see a really fluffy, beautiful giraffe. Uh, Santa brought that for me. Santa? Can you say that again? Santa brought it for me. Am I right that it's a giraffe? Wow. I'm so glad I'm right. I was a little concerned. I thought giraffes had very long necks. This is an unusual giraffe, right? And we have a set of sunglasses that I think might work on the giraffe. Oh, I'm sorry. Giraffes don't wear sunglasses. Fancy girls wear sunglasses. Really nice looking. How does the room look in sunglasses, Ella? Blurry. Darker? No, blurry. Blurry. Our glasses have to be clean. What else in this box? What is it? A ball. A ball? What does it do? It's from a ball pit. So, did, um, so when you're in a ball pit, balls bounce, right? Does it bounce in here? Oh, it does a little bit. Let me try. You ready? Oh, you have some good eye-hand coordination there. Yeah, even as you watched, even as you held your glasses. You know, Ella, what I love about this spirit box is that it is cozy, it is fashionable, and it is about bouncing back which is something that we have to do after Christmas. I've got a very important question for you. When, see, I think, I think the giraffe can pull the glasses off. I think, I think she looks good in them. So after you opened presents, did you go back to bed and sleep? No, did your mommy go back to bed and sleep? Yes. Yes, your mommy did. Your mommy was bouncing back. And that is part of what God helps us to do every week when we show up and we spend time in our community of people 
and we love on each other a little bit and we get ready for the new week ahead of us. We bounce back with song and prayer and love. Tell you something in your ear. She's going to tell me something in my ear. Santa brought you LOLs. I think I need a code. It was Gigi. It was, it was, Gigi was Santa's partner. Really a wonderful thing. Ella, what makes us so happy at Christmas is that you are loved and cared for, and we know that's what God wants for all of God's children. Thank you for a wonderful spirit box. Shall we say our prayer? God be in my head. God be in my heart. God be on my left. God be on my right. God be beneath me, God be above me, God be in the faces of all who love me. Thank you so much, Ella. Before our scripture reading today, will you join me in a moment of prayer? God of light, You shine your presence into places that lack it. You envelop those places. Allow us to see you in these moments where there is darkness, where we feel that you aren't there, but you are. You're ever present, you're always with us, you're in the faces of those around us. And in, and in moments like these where we get to pause Allow us to see you just a little bit more, a little bit clearer. Amen. Our epistle reading today comes from Revelations chapter 3, verses 20 through 22. Listen now for the word of the Lord. Listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to you and eat with you and you with me. To the one who conquers, I will give a place with me on my throne, just as myself conquered and sat down with my Father on his throne. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So the really great thing about the text that Parker just read was that I'm always benefited to be reminded that the book of Revelation begins by a number of letters to the churches. And from the third chapter of Revelation, we get the reading to the church of Laodicea. And Paul is quite snarky and sarcastic in this letter to the church. He says to the church, you're neither hot nor cold, and I just would like to spit you out of my mouth. Um, and so, the very end is this more sincere plea with Laodicea that he knocks on the door and waits for them to answer, um, imagining uh, really the divine energy as knocking. So I invite you to rise up for the reading of the gospel from the Gospel of Matthew, the second chapter, verses 13 through 20. This has some editorial comment in it. So, with apology. Now, after they had left, that is the wise men, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to destroy the child. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and they went to Egypt which was just down and to the west. And they remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt I've called my son. When Herod saw that he'd been tricked by the wise man, he was infuriated. And he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. 
Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah, and I quote, a voice was heard in Ramah wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they were no more. Now when Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up and take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel, which was just up and towards the east. But he paused there when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father, Herod. Joseph was afraid to go there. And so he went on to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth so that what was spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. In this way, Joseph covered a lot of ground. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Thanks. You may be seated. The birth narratives of Christ, as I mentioned in a previous sermon, are just one of the many birth narratives that are in Scripture. Indeed, just one of the many miraculous birth narratives of Scripture, the first miraculous birth narrative being that between Abraham and Sarah, and Isaac is born. Then Isaac prays for his preferred wife, Sarah, to have a child. Then there is the relationship between Manoah and his unnamed wife for Judge Samson. And then there is Eli and Hannah and the arrival of the prophet Samuel, who will guide the kingship. Mary and Joseph hold a unique space. Their miraculous birth narrative receives more space within the canon than all the rest. But each and every birth narrative of scripture has one thing in common. They arrive, pregnancy arrives, children arrive in the midst of tyranny. Pregnancy in these narratives is more than pregnancy. You do not have to be biologically present to be full as the scriptures suggest. Children are not just children. Children are symbols of possibility. And so in the midst of tyranny, birth narratives arrive to communicate that you and I are to host a fullness of possibilities in the midst of tyranny. The birth narratives of Christ mean to cue us specifically that tyranny happens while we are sleeping. Joseph has dreams. And the narrative by using dreams means to punctuate that when Joseph traveled, he traveled wide awake, <laughs> aware, mindful and cognizant of the practicalities and the profound nature of his journey. And so he moves a little bit to the west and a little bit to the east, and eventually things will settle right down in and through Jerusalem. I think the late Desmond Tutu also gave great attention 
to tyranny that happens while human beings are sleeping. What he is most known for is really his commitment to restorative justice in the wake of tyranny. Restorative justice being that justice that depends on accountability, not punishment. Restorative justice depends on accountability and possibility, wherein communities come together to decide collectively what the consequences shall be. To, to recognize that human beings do want to be held accountable in right ways when they are in loving community. But he was also kind of a funny guy. Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela were both known for the humor they used to deploy their efforts of justice and equity. So this morning I thought we'd have a little fun. I'll have fun by myself. You can see the nature of how ridiculous it is and then you can decide if you want to have fun. I will be standing to demonstrate and then I will sit and demonstrate in a way that you can participate without standing. But for the sake of being awake, for the sake of the fact that tyranny happens when we are sleeping, there is a game that has been studied by the neuroscience, depart uh, neuroscience vocation meant to keep a human being fully awake. And what that means is that both hemispheres of our brain are activated to perceive the world. You might remember that the left side of the brain is really built to digest the facts, to break things down analytically and logically, and that the right side of the brain deals in broad brush strokes, is known for being creative, even though the left side of the brain has its own creativity. Left and right working together is a fully awake state. And there's actually a game to get this done. They call it the cross crawl game, like crawling like a baby, the cross crawl game. I've renamed it for the sake of Laodicea and I've called it the cross knock game. Are you ready? Cross crawl, cross knock is played like this. You lift the left leg. Now the only person in the room that I know that could do it better than me is Alicia Kaufman because she's got better balance than me, but she's going to stay in the pew. So you lift the left leg, you bring the right hand to the left knee, you draw the left arm back alongside the heart. And then you center up and you lift the right knee, you place the left hand on the right knee, you pull the right hand back alongside the heart. Now, you don't have to lift your legs. Here's the modification. You come to your toes, or you imagine that you are on your toes. It really doesn't make a difference. So imagining or bringing the left Heel up so that you are on the left toes, right hand to left knee, left hand alongside heart, center up, drop it down. Lift the right heel, left hand to right knee, right hand pulls back alongside the heart. What the neuroscience department tells us is that when we play the cross crawl, what I call the cross knock, is that we wake up both sides of the hemisphere and have a more powerful perception of the world. Desmond Tutu, I think, was con committed to restorative justice because he knew and had a tenderness for how easy it is for us to fall asleep. The cross crawl, the cross knock, is really important, according to a gentleman, a neuroscientist, and a psychiatrist whose name is Ian McGilchrist. 
Chris Palmer put me onto his book, The Master and His Emissary. The book is totally about left and right brain, and McGilchrist makes this argument about our culture, that we are under the tyranny of our left hemisphere. <laughs> and in so being, we struggle to stay connected to what makes us human. So you see, McGilchrist would love the game, Tutu would love the game, you will know what to do with the game. But here's the dilemma for me. My dilemma is this, that when I perceive the world in front of me, I think to myself, wow, Leslie, you see like nobody else can see. I mean, you see some things really, really clearly. And I'm not wrong about that. But when that voice becomes tyrannical in my head, I imagine that I see all things well. <laughs> and in fact, that is not true. When I see some things clearly, there are other things that I perceive not at all. Take, for example, the relational dilemma between a parent and a child and a cookie jar. The child is on their toes, reaching for the jar that is purposely out of reach. The parent looks at the child and it's adorable and the parent says, oh, 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 oh. I see. Of course, the child cannot have the cookie because that is not good nutrition. Of course, the child cannot have the cookie because someone has to be in charge. And the parent is not wrong, but the voice borders on tyrannical and the parent is vulnerable to falling asleep if they do not recognize the shaking underneath the toes and the straining and the grunting to reach the cookie jar. It is the woke parent that bends down to say to the child, my goodness, what a reach. What are you reaching so hard for? I heard you grunting. To which the child might say to the parent, I want to be big. And it isn't about the cookie at all. Think of the relationship between adult child and adult parent. The adult parent really struggling with all of the challenges, the virtuous challenges of shedding the mortal coil. And the adult child watching the struggle. One day, the adult child turns to their spouse and says, I'm going to have to talk to dad about the car. It is a fearsome conversation. And the child explains why the speed limit has increased and why it is dangerous uh, to navigate with eyesight that is diminishing and all of the details all of the left brain details are absolutely right. But it is the woke adult child that notices the posture of the parent because they have to talk about the car. And just when the adult child is tempted to say, it's for your own good, they hold their breath. They wake up to the right brain and say to their parent, what is the heavy head about? Why have your shoulders slumped? Out of which the adult parent lifts and might say something like this, I want to experience power and strength. 
I don't have to have it all, but I want some. And it's not about the car at all. And in these small, ordinary ways, the cross knocking, waking up to the left and the right side of who we are biologically, allows us to begin to open up to the right and left side. Here's the beautiful thing about the Joseph narrative. I believe his journey to the east, to the west, and back up to the east and down is really a nice image of hemispheric travel. And when we've traveled both, we've got enough spine to do what we need to do in our living. There are people that say that the democracy of the United States of America has got some marking indicators has got some marking indicators that the democracy is atrophying and autocracy is strengthening. There are people who watch this. I, I can never remember the name, let me get it. The people who watch it are um, the Center for Systemic Peace. And what they do is they watch the world and they have about 23 markers or something that they manage countries. They watch their civic and organized life. And while you and I are focusing on countries around the world that don't look democratic, the Center for Systemic Peace is saying there are some markers that make the United States of America more of an anocracy that is a combination of democracy and autocracy. And you see, on the day of Desmond Tutu, Tutu's death, I think, I think he, through the voice of Christ, whispers to us, wake up to what divides and separates. Trust in what you perceive and what you know, but realize that in that conviction, you are on the edge of tyranny, tyranny itself. After all, Herod is not some other hero, some other villain. Herod is a part of the human condition. So recognize what you know, hold to the confidence of it, but recognize the tyranny of it and then in your wisdom, play a game. <laughs> play a game that begins with the cross and moves through knocking and journeying from the east and the west of our hemispheric brain, the east and the west of our relationships, and draw it in and cradle it up because there is no one but you and me to preserve the democratic process, which is not Christian, but Christianity by God acknowledges choice, individual uniqueness, and the important role that we all play because we are called by God to move forward. So when it's so serious, Tutu, Mandela, the greats. They say, play the right game for the victory that will include so many. May God bless the door that knocks because we open, the door that open, oh good Lord, that was a terrible conclusion. Let's start over. May God bless the door that opens because we knocked. Amen. Please rise in body or spirit for our hymn.
and stars go by, yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all thy years are met with Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above. While mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wandering love. O morning stars together, Proclaim the holy birth, and the praises sing to God the King, and peace to all the earth. How silently, how silently, the wondrous gift is given. God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Friends, will you join me in our affirmation of faith? We affirm our faith in God's Son, grounded in a trade that of a carpenter. We affirm our faith in the Bible printed with memories that have a unique depth and breadth for the present. We affirm our faith in the Holy Spirit and Creator who continues to make all things new, emerging revelation. We affirm the sacraments of our Presbyterian Church. Baptism encourages us to perceive life flowing beneath all surface structures. Communion encourages us to digest the energy of Christ that we may live out his love and grace. We affirm the strength resilience of a manger from nail and wood. The creche rivals the crucifix and catching up and nurturing God's new moment. May our affirmation allow that God's infancy moments may find leverage in our lives. Thanks, you may be seated. And as we prepare our hearts and minds, the session and I want to extend our gratitude for the generosity of the Christmas offering. It's not too late to contribute to that if you so choose, but let us now prepare to share.
God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God, all of ye have me host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. <clears throat> Friends, you may be seated. Allow us to take a pause real quick and join me in a moment of prayer. Living and eternal God, creator of heaven and earth, we come in the midst of your present, knowing that we are recipients of your great and wonderful gifts. The earth, the sky, the waters, friends, family, Christmas joys, They've all been given to us here in such abundance. And we lead enormously privileged lives. Don't let our comfort blind us to the newness of, our, of your continual work in our lives. A newness that is taking us beyond our comfort zone into areas where we would not choose on our own. A newness that challenges our norms and feels out. It feels out of control at times. However, this much doesn't change. You're our creator, our redeemer, our sustainer, and we are your people, bound to you in love and held close. You take us as we are, even in our uncertainties and questioning, and invite us into this newness and wholeness. And as your people, we pray in the name of your Son, who has gone ahead of us and beckons us into relationship. We pray the prayer that he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> Friends, will you rise for your charge and benediction? Here's your charge. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold fast to what is good. Return no evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Uplift the weak. Support the suffering. Honor all people, including yourself. Do this in all things, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Any of it and all of it might be possible for you and for me because we are enveloped by our Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, and Friend. Amen. Oh, sing a song of Bethlehem, of shepherds watching there, and of the news that came to them from angels in the air. The light that shone on Bethlehem fills all the world today. Of Jesus' birth and peace on earth, the angels sing away. 